Hello, and welcome to Michael Chekhov, the NMCA way, focusing on the five guiding principles Mr. Chekhov offers us, in particular, guiding principle number one. I am Lisa Dalton. I'm president and uh, one of the master certifying teachers of the National Michael Chekhov Association. And uh, my co-host today is Will Kilroy, who is the vice president of the NMCA, also a co-founder with uh, me and with Mala Powers, who was the executrix of Michael Chekhov's estate. And uh, today, uh, and at this time, Will Kilroy is department chair at New Mexico State University, where he hosts our annual summer checkoff training intensive called the CTI, which you may hear it referred to as we talk. And today, our program will uh, feature Will and myself discussing the five guiding principles that Mr. Chekhov uh, offered in the series called On Theater and the Art of Acting audio series recorded in 1955, shortly before he passed away. He laid out five basic principles that the NMCA utilizes to construct its uh, renowned pedagogy. For those of you who have the uh, Michael Chekhov Technique playbook, you can check out page 79, where it talks about the five guiding principles. And this episode is the first of a series of five where we will address each of the five guiding principles individually. Our participants today are alumni from the CTI, the Checkoff Training Intensive that the NMC offers. And we invite you now to begin by listening to Mr. Chekhov himself in an excerpt from On Theater and the Art of Acting. Facilitate for them the comprehending of all the exercises, their meaning, their purpose, and also the way of doing them. I'll try to express myself as briefly as I can. Five of those guiding thoughts I have in mind. Every one of us actors knows well how important it is to have our bodies well developed, to have them obedient to our psychology, to have them sensitive to our psychology. We know how important it is that our bodies become very fine instruments for conveying our experiences to the audience, that our body is in full harmony with our psychology, with our soul. And many of our colleagues make a real true effort to develop them by different means like gymnastics, calisthenics, dancing, fencing, and so on. All these things are good, useful, but still, it is not that development which an actor needs. Therefore, the first principle I am going to talk about, or rather to mention to you, is that our way of developing our bodies is the way to develop it from inside by means of our psychology and not only by outer means, which might develop our bodies physically perfectly well, but not quite suitable for acting. What does it mean to develop our bodies by means of our psychology? It means that all our physical exercises will be considered and done as psychophysical exercises. We want to fill, to permeate our bodies with psychological values. Therefore, while doing all our bodily exercises, it is good to have in mind uh, this side of the exercise, whatever it might be, the psychological side more than the physical, Everything like development of our imagination 
or using of the psychological gesture. All such means make our physical exercises to psychophysical. And I want to emphasize this psycho side of our exercises. Then every one of us who wants to use these bodily exercises will never be led astray. He will always know what is the gist, the essence of every exercise, psychological side of it. We have to imagine our body as a kind of sponge which eagerly absorbs all what is given to it in a form of psychological values. And that is the first guiding principle I wanted to mention to you. Okay, very good. Will, let me unmute you here. And um, how does that feel to listen to it, Will? Well, one thing that I think he brings out very clearly there is the idea that we are training our bodies from the inside. And I think the checkoff technique has sometimes gotten a bad rap as this outside in sort of technique, you know, that you're doing things physically, but he clearly states it. You're not just doing something physically. You are creating yourself as an actor from the inside out because you're connecting it to the psyche. So I think that is so clearly explained in that principle. I think that's very true, Will. And uh, it's one of the reasons why we create our pedagogy um, as we do the structure of our uh, checkoff training intensive begins with a very strong focus on the psychophysical exercises, these uh, areas down here, what we consider the, the three primary uh, psychophysical exercises of uh, contracting and expanding, molding, flowing, flying, radiating, and the archetypal gestures. Uh, and one could say uh, that perhaps the three sister sensations are, um, you know, perhaps a, a psychophysical exercise as well. And um, it's, uh, it's, of course, an option for anyone to begin to study anywhere on the chart. But we choose to really start to dig into the psychophysical exercises uh, be, in, this, in essence, because we are following these five guiding principles that Michael Chekhov structures there. So I'm curious, um, we have a number of participants with us, and I'm curious if any of our participants, uh, who many of whom are certified, NMCA certified teachers here, um, and or in the process of uh, getting that, or and everyone here has been studying with NMCA, uh, whether there are any thoughts about how you guys are using the work uh, and how are you, uh, you know, are you placing a priority on the psychophysical exercises? Is it not an option in your environment? Um, uh, any, any thoughts about that, anyone? Just uh, unmute and Virginia. I'm working with teenagers right now mm -hmm. and I'm trying to bring this physical first to engage them in fun and it's like divided. Some of them will go for it and use their energy and the other 13 will sit down because they're allowed to opt out. So it's interesting to, to, to offer the physical first because we started with the ball toss and so to offer that um with as little explanation as possible right to just see what happens in their body and then um have to cut it i plan for 45 minutes they pay attention for 20 so it's just interesting to see the residue um, yeah that that's all i had yeah good <laughs> Anyone else? I'm sorry, it's Gail. I was raising my hand. I'm sorry. <laughs> That's good. That's good, Gail. There you are. I'm sorry. I've, I've got 
50 things I'm trying to do at the same time. Um, I'm having an interesting experience right now because I am teaching an acting two class um, in a two-year school where uh, all of the students who were present today have done a semester of uh, checkoff centered work with me. And um, it was like a rock and roll review. We're gonna do all of these and then in the two hours and then at the end of that time, you have five minutes to prepare a version you will share with us. And I am seeing people begin to uh, be able to um, uh, understand how the tools can work. We had someone today, a young man who was, he's very facile, he's very experienced, and he's very glib. And I said, okay, so they created a score, and he went from, oh, I don't, I don't know, let's just say real force to expansion. And so he did it, and then I said, okay, now immediately reverse that. Go from expansion to, I guess it was expansion to contraction. And he was like, oh, not prepared to do that, which was a good thing. And as he began to slowly feel his way through that, his voice was different. Our whole experience of him is different. And I said, what changed for you? You weren't controlling what you thought the performance should be now. And he said it was amazing because I was d discovering. He said, I felt authentic. I felt real. These are terms that get used a lot in my particular community. And so it got us on a whole discussion of what that meant when we say someone's work is truthful or authentic or whatever. What is it that we're talking about? And my whole thing, of course, is it's not magical, it's not mystical, it has to do with ease, or it has to do with getting out of your head and into the space, or whatever. But it was marvelous to see these young people be able to, oh my God, this light is right in your eyes. <laughs> it was marvelous for these young people to be able to go, whoa, I see now what committing to the tools can do, following the tool can do, trusting the tool can do in terms of creating a new awareness and other choices that might inform me as a person, an actor, or maybe uh, in an analytical way, I never thought of the character or the line as being possible to be spoken or understood this way. So it's just wonderful to see these young people who are having now a second semester be able to uh, trust the tools and see how they might work. Because I experienced some of what that previous speaker was last semester, but with some time and commitment, that's changing. And I also had, I'm teaching um, a Chekhov class to a mixed group at a theater in town. Uh, and I have people who have never done an acting class, but have done a lot of improv. And I have people who are professional actors and I have people who are young actors and older actors. And they are astounded by what the attention to tools and craft can do. Uh, not just in terms of giving them new things they can do, but in terms of how technique, craft, can allow them to be free, to be present in a way they haven't experienced before. I have a young woman in here, a professional actor, who has um, crippling stage fright. And the prospect of having tools is having an amazing effect on her. So, I mean, these, these are just my two present experiences with the work, so. Thank you, Gail. Thank you. Anyone else? Uh, yeah, hi. Uh, I just want to second what Gail said. I mean, it's just, uh, it's an amazing technique, particularly when you're introducing it to, uh, to new actors. And what, what I find amazing is how it almost seems like a cheat. Uh, I do expansion and contraction. That's, you know, I find myself proselytizing this technique all around my community. I'm introducing it to my community, basically. And, uh, and I always start with an expansion contraction exercise as a way to, to introduce the, the technique to them. And, uh, and they're like, this, this feels like cheating. 
this feels like I'm, I'm cheating here. And I'm like, no, that, this is the real thing. You can still find a, a truthful way of performing through uh, psychophysical exercises that feels like cheating, but it's actually just a shortcut to the work. Great. And Jeff, can I just ask, do they feel like it's cheating because it's easier than what they've been trying to do, squeezing out emotion in the past? Is that the cheating part? or I think that's absolutely okay. why it feels like cheating to them because okay. Acting isn't supposed to be easy, right? It's it's supposed to be something where I'm I'm I have to pull uh, out my guts from the inside, and I have to, to to think about you know three pages of character biography, and I have to I have to really suffer. And and you're like, no, you don't have to do any of that. You can just you know act truthfully right here, right now, in the moment, uh, using psychophysical exercises. And they're like, what? And it's, it's just, uh, uh, it's rewarding for me, especially to see that in my students. Right. Was, Kevin, did you want to share anything? Uh, so just one of the things that I've found, sorry, can you hear me? Yeah. I'm not sure if this is picked up. Okay. Uh, it, it definitely changes depending on where I'm teaching. So this, this fact that it is billed as a psychophysical technique. Sometimes when I'm teaching, I'm teaching a straight up acting class. Sometimes I am very much the movement person. Um, and so I, I have found there are times when I have to kind of keep one, one aspect on the sly um, so that uh, I'm not seen as, as overstepping my bounds or stepping out of my silo. Um, but to me, that was part of the appeal of the Chekhov work is that it can bridge the, the you know, analytical side of acting with the physical side of acting. So it's, it's interesting the flexibility that's given me to, to bring this into movement classes or into acting classes and kind of make it fit the paradigm they're looking for, but still allow me to kind of patch together the different aspects of their training. I'm, one, I'm curious, Kevin, whether or not, or, or I'm curious to know more about what you don't share in the movement or do share in the movement that you don't or don't share in the acting that you do in the movement? Sure, and some of it's just on, on how, I, how I package it, how I refer to it. Um, for example, I, I tend to lump together the movement qualities and psychological gesture into a unit where, which I think of as sort of physical subtext. Um, and if I'm teaching an acting class, I will, definitely draw parallels between that directly and this idea of, of your objective and your tactics. And, and it's very much a part of that kind of traditional Stanislavski scoring. Um, whereas in a movement class, I might not make that explicit. And if the students discover that and make that connection, awesome. But, you know, at some, sometimes I'm being told not to delve into the, any of the, you know, script analysis or objective obstacle tactic stuff, but that's, that's the acting teacher's territory, not the movement teacher's territory. Um, so trying to find ways to, to kind of sneak things in in a, a, in a way that is palatable to the, the paradigm of whichever group I'm teaching at the time. Great. Very good. Any other thoughts? Jet, did you want to share any thoughts about the, the physical, a psychophysical aspect of uh, our activity? Um, well, I can just say that um, I'm in an ongoing improv class, and although she doesn't teach the Chekhov, I, I hear her say things that are like that, and, um, and uh, I'm in that class to just stay fluid and keep my mind more expanding um but i do notice that um some of the work that we do is just physical and um and and that works you know for me does that make sense mm -hmm. um because i'm not doing a checkoff per se um but i've been influenced by that and um that, that's about all i can say is that i feel more and more expanded and more comfortable with everything. Would you say as an actress that you, because you've done all the psychophysical exercises of the checkoff work that you have a greater sense of freedom in your, 
in your improv? Uh, yeah. Um, and it, it, it all kind of blends sometimes. Like I, I think of atmosphere and I think of, um, you know, putting on a character and I, uh, those things just come to me. And I remember that from the work I've done with you, you guys. And, um, and so I think, uh, yes, in, in a way that I don't even realize um, that uh, I, I actually do get people saying, oh, wow, that was really great. And I do believe that it's all, um, it's blending inside of me and I might not even realize it. I just know that I feel pretty good at times. Great. Being open and willing. Thank you. Yeah. And Jet, I would be curious if the impulse work that you did last summer when we did the advanced course that you were part of, we did all that wonderful impulse work that was definitely improvisational. If yes. you feel like that has added to your repertoire to be able to improv more successfully. Um, I think so. I think I'm naturally just kind of, you know, like willing. <laughs> and so, um, and, and like I said, it's all blend, it's all kind of mixing inside of me like a stew, like, um, and that's who Jet is. Um, and, and um, it is easier for me to get up there now and my mind is uh, working. Um, it's, it's just, uh, I'm faster. I don't know how to describe, I'm not as afraid of certain exercises that my teacher will give me when I, I used to be afraid of maybe a year. I think I've been going to her for about a year and a half or something. And I used to be more afraid of these little exercises, like you're doing this and you're gonna be doing that. Now you're gonna be, and um, <laughs> do you understand what I'm trying to say? And um, I'm not, uh, it's coming easier for me that's great yeah I'm like oh wow like a year ago I was scared to get up in front of, of class which um, now there's 20 people in the class I was afraid uh, like I couldn't think of anything and I would be like <laughs> you know um, uh, but it, I think it's e things are easier for me and I feel more fluid and oh yeah definitely this work has affected me. Beautiful. Thank you. I'm going to leap on that into um, a, uh, a, a segue that I wanted to talk about from, uh, from Jet's comments. Uh, and that is that uh, when we're talking about the psychophysical exercises in the NMCA pedagogy, we offer this quantum peak chart where we talk about the pie, your piece of the pie. And so I wanted to, to just mention that uh, image that it is, um, I, I'm curious, so I'm just gonna hold it up here because I didn't locate the um, sign. Hold on, let me find my, see, see um, this uh, chart. And uh, the reason, just to share with you how this relates to your um, uh, guiding principle number one, and the reason that that uh, chart developed. And it is when we look at the psychophysical exercises in relation to that chart, what we're looking to solve first and foremost, is that situation where the actor gets a brilliant idea and tries to do it and it doesn't come out at all the way they meant to. And I call that the big disclick. It's like sometimes it clicks and uh, sometimes it disclicks. And, uh, and very often the problem that 
exists that makes that disclick happen lies in the field of the psychophysical exercises. The psychophysical exercises are the central solution to fixing the situation where you have images inside and they are not able to be expressed in your body. And so as we see in that chart, we come to understand that the human being only uses a small portion, maybe five to 8% of their potential. And those decisions regarding what part of themselves they're going to use occur in the first five years, 95% of those decisions in the first five years of their life, some say four years of their life. And they come because of the environment, they come because of the genetics, and they come because of some mysterious, um, invisible or intangible, as Mr. Chekhov calls it, aspect that make, makes two identical twins of the same genes in the same environment come out to be two very different people. Whatever that mystical or, or invisible or intangible element is, that's the third element that influences which aspects of all of our potentials we're going to use. Those choices start to imprint biologically on the body. And those choices could be looked at in our psychophysical exercises as decisions like how expanded or contracted am I going to be and when will I expand? And when will I contract? And what will expanding and contracting mean to me emotionally? Because we know, we understand in our training that the act of expanding, the act of contracting is in effect a scientific act. It is not colored specifically by a positive or negative value. It's, it's a universal quality that could be colored into a negative or into a positive. And then we see also the four qualities of movement as they relate to the four elements of earth, of water, of air, and of light. And we, we are in that process as you know, youth and infants in choosing, are we going to move more like earth or more like water or more like air or more like light or fire? And what is it going to mean when we do move that way? And then there are the gestures, the sense of how um, we achieve and accomplish our, our goals. Are we going to push through life? Are we going to pull through life? Are we going to reach? Are we going to drag? Are we going to tear or smash or lift or gather? Are we going to penetrate? And what are those going to mean to us? Which ones will we use a lot of? Which ones will we learn to avoid completely? And so all of those fundamental uh, processes expanding, contracting, molding, flowing, flying, radiating, and the basic archetypal gestures are what are present in all of those imaginary bodies and centers and other tools, our response to atmospheres, our psychological gestures are all made up of movement patterns that can be found or identified through the basic psycho physical exercises. So we can think of any imaginary body, any image that we adopt, any uh, center, any psychological gesture, we could look at it and we could describe its impact on us by saying it leads me into a contraction that is molding and is um, twisting, is pulling in, or gathering in, for example. And so that is uh, because these psychophysical exercises cover and allow you to do anything on the rest of the chart, uh, they, they can do that because 
they help you free up what is what we call from that chart in your piece of the pie. So that's the reason that we use in our pedagogy that quantum peak chart that describes how we have the higher self, the whole higher self, and when we come into our body, we can only use a tiny portion of it. And our character actually will use only a tiny portion too, but it'll be different in some way from our own. And through the psychophysical exercises, they are this guiding principle number one is the fundamental means that will allow us to express the transformations that we seek to. So I, I hope that um, uh, that is that that is useful and when we teach it in the, uh, in the NMCA pedagogy, one of the shortcuts that it provides us is this language of being able to identify what is in, and this is on the path to knowing thyself. So how do you know yourself so that you can know the character and play the difference, which Mr. Chekhov invites us to do. Uh, we can say, we call it knowing what's in our piece of the pie. And through the psychophysical exercises, we actually can expand to have a bigger piece of a pie, <laughs> which is exciting. But I'm curious for anyone whether or not this concept of uh, this piece of the pie is something that uh, helps them uh, have, as teachers, have you carried it forward uh, does it, is it too confusing? Would you like to, but you don't really know how? Uh, any thoughts uh, uh, about that? And Will, if you would start, um, any thoughts you have regarding this, this whole concept of how the psychophysical exercises restore to us the uh, energetic, imaginative, and physical freedom? Sure. Well, I just used this piece of the pie diagram yesterday in class, so it's very fresh. So I'm teaching a 100 level stage movement class. So a lot of them have not had much acting experience. Uh, so we're doing these things. And to me, to explain the piece of the pie, to give them a reason, why are you doing this? Why are we moving in these different ways? Why are you trying to expand beyond what's comfortable for you? Why are you crunching up in a way that feels uncomfortable to you? Uh, so in explaining that and explaining how characters live outside your personal piece of the pie, to me, it gets them to invest more in what they're doing because they realize the purpose for it. So again, as we've talked about in the intensive, people learn in different ways and some of them need to know the why for am I doing this? Uh, so that's really helpful to me to use that pie. And I don't get into a lot of detail about it, you know, and I don't have time to do that, but I draw the the pie, I do the piece, I talk about it, what do they come in with biologically, what does their environment give them, all of that. Uh, and I do think it is incredibly helpful to them. So I would be curious what other people have experienced. Do they draw a pie? Do they refer to it? Anyone else? Uh, Beth, Beth. Gail, I mean, I'll just say that I haven't used the pie imagery but um, I talk about this all the time. For me, because I have students in my classes who are um, a combination of actors and people who are taking this because uh, sign language says they should take it or they always want to try acting or they need an elective or whatever, um, I, I talk about the fact that what we do in here is something that will enrich their artistic life, but also their everyday life. And um, that the work is all about choices and that your life is all about choices. And that we all come in making certain choices due to whatever we have experienced or we were born with, but we have the opportunity to increase those choices and to be able to be other than what we are up to this point, whether it is as a person or is, it is as someone creating a character for the stage. And I have had the most amazing um, experiences working with thinking, feeling, and willing. That may be the most beneficial 
um, tool that the young actors I'm dealing with um, uh, have um, because it is so transformational and we have so many young women who come in and have no will force at all or some people who come in and have no uh, feeling force at all so um, we can move into areas that encourage them to explore, for instance, their emotional life, but in a way that's not threatening. So it's not about, think about the worst moment you ever had in your life and blah, blah, blah. So I will talk about the fact that there is emotional recall and affective memory that is used in some techniques, but that that's not um, necessarily a way to um, expand that part of you or bring that part of you to to the work and that people feel safe because of that um, for people who can't stand on one leg i mean i have people who cannot stand on i mean who cannot stand on two legs you know or who stand habitually with one foot on the ground and then only the toes touching on the other leg so there were some really um uh, important discoveries to be made about self and people can see them the students in the class can see them and we can talk about them not as something that is a fault or a shortcoming but that's a choice you're making now and it really doesn't matter why you're making it or how you came to it but here's another possibility and what happens how does your body change how does your mind change how does your voice change when you make this adjustment so it's been incredibly powerful. So that's been the most powerful tool that I've dealt with. Great, thank you. Kevin, were you gonna say something? Nope. I, I wanted to say oh, something. Oh, here, yes. Um, when I was in Berlin with you and I, uh, I heard uh, one more time this lecture of the Quantum Quick, um, it was so mind blowing. I, I couldn't remember exactly that you did it the last time that I've been in, in New Mexico. I didn't remember it uh, very well, very well. So it was so uh, refreshing to me and, and so deep. So I, I, ha I had to do it. And I did a lecture, only, only, only this, this uh, uh, part. I, I took, um, I did it uh, at home and I, you know, looked at my notes and um, and I did this lecture to, to a few um, uh, actors. And some of them were blown away. And some of them were, mm, I don't know, I don't know. So I started to do uh, this course um, to professional actors in a studio, in a very very well known studio here, and um, I didn't I didn't start with this. I started psychophysical exercises and everything, and and then after um, six six lessons or something, six weeks, um, a lot of them were sick, and I said, okay, what are we going to do? Let me share with you something, and then I did this lecture they almost uh, beat me that I didn't do it in the first class. They said, <laughs> why didn't you do it? It's so, uh, no one speaks to us like this. And no, it's very, it's, it was very helpful for them. So um, for me, it's, it's, it's tricky. It's a tricky one because you're talking about the higher, the higher ego and the high ego. And, and there's, there's a concept there that I, I'm afraid that, people won't get. So this is the, the problem for me now, but I'm starting to, you know, look it up and do it more. Great. Great. Have courage. And, you know, one, one of the things that's really important is to uh, keep exploring and asking for, you know, inspiration, right? Download from Mr. Chekhov and the powers that be, um, imaginary body of Mr. Chekhov, um, to, uh, to help you find the way into your particular group, 
uh, to mm -hmm. adjust uh, what this is, you know, like if, you know, I, I talk about this higher ego is kind of like an iCloud, an invisible iCloud that has all this information and contains so much in it. And maybe for people who don't want to get too mystical, giving them that, you know, the, the option of that image um, might, might be another easy way. Um, and or there might be something in the culture and in the spiritual practices of the people in your particular world that, um, you know, that, that has, that can work as a, as a metaphor for what this is, mm -hmm. you know, so feel free to, you know, play around with. And, and one more thing just uh, that I wanted to say about uh, psychophysical is that for me, I found that for teenagers, the, the importance of staccato legato is that this is something that is very helpful for them to get it because to do only a warm up with staccato legato and, you know, just do this with your right hand and then do this with your right hand and start to feel what it's, you know, what it's all about and they're doing with, the, with their whole bodies. So um, this is very good. And afterwards they know they have the, like a v vocabulary that they're proud of. Oh, it's more staccato, it's more legato. And it's very basic, but it's very, um, it's very important. I Do think. you, uh, you're talking about the rate staccato legato radiation? No, 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 no. just, the, just the concept. The rhythm, yeah. yeah. Yeah, tempo and rhythm. And one of the things I wanted to add about that uh, was kind of on my list of things to mention. Uh, why in general, uh, the tempo rhythm is not um, listed as a psychophysical exercise, uh, but it's rather uh, up here on the, in the realm of composition is because in expanding and contracting and in the molding, flowing, flying, radiating, you actually have, uh, you have that, you, you actually have the different speeds and you have the different qualities, uh, in it. If you really dig into and express all of those if you practice expand like one could say that the staccato legato radiating exercise that we we love and 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 ultimately i while i'm sort of contradicting myself i'm here saying that if you could only do one psychophysical exercise that is it um that uh, that um you would you will feel the the rhythms and the tempos in in these naturally uh, that that exercise is a process of you know expanding with staccato expanding with legato contracting with legato back and forth so um, uh, so yeah thanks for bringing that up excellent Kevin. I just wanted to add a quick note on the, the languaging because we work with such a broad range of students and professionals. Um, this is an example of, of the repackaging with my undergrads talking about something as like the slice of pie that you have to offer works fine. But often with my professional MFA actors, it might be, so this is what's in your portfolio, right? Um, and, and just reframing it to sound a little bit more what, what they're looking for, but it's this, you know, the content's the same. The semantics can change. Yes, that's great. That's great. And I think it's important for us to help share these alternative semantics. You know, like I love that, you know, what's already in your portfolio, you know, that that's a really useful term. So I appreciate that. Yeah. Other thoughts? I tend to um, not be able to cover this because time is at such a, a commodity in my world. Um, I, I try to briefly go over it, but one of the, <laughs> I find myself using this argument, this as an argument a lot 
when I'm when I'm arguing with Meisner people, <laughs> and and you know when we're and I don't mean arguing. I mean like I have a lot of Meisner friends, and we're talking about the different techniques and how we can approach it. And I'm like, well, this is this is the way uh, Chekhov looks at the thing, and he and they're they're like higher self, lower self. They're like, well, I don't understand. And and uh, and as I'm explaining, they're like, oh, so I almost convinced them. <laughs> Well, that's great. And that's a good opportunity for us to plug an upcoming book, which is Michael Chekhov and Sanford Meisner, Collisions and Convergences in After Training, that both Will and I have collaborated on. We've um, made contributions to that book, and it's um, being edited by uh, Anjali Deshpande Hutchinson, who is an NMCA certified teacher. She's the department chair at Bucknell University, and mm -hmm. that should be coming out soon. Will, do you know anything about it? Oh, uh, and but soon. Okay. All Very right. Soon. So yeah, so so hopefully we will, uh, you all will pick up a copy of that and be able to uh, spread the word. One of the uh, things that seems to be coming up. Uh, is how we share this concept of the higher the higher self uh, in a way that is um, receptive to people who are not ready to roll in at that um, uh, you know more I, I'm just gonna say Rudolf Steiner perspective based perspective uh, more spiritual science based perspective that that Chekhov brings in. Um, but, uh, uh, to, to call your, it, it is pretty common knowledge that, uh, the human being only uses a small percentage of their potential. And that's why I come in from that sort of Einstein thought he was operating at 8%. And I love that this Einstein quote because most people have some level of respect for for the scientific einsteinian uh statements and to say that the average human being does not use their full potential and we but we could we could we come we're born with the potentials and then we start limiting them and when, uh, when you ask that question, have you ever had a great idea and it didn't come out right? That's because it's outside of your repertoire. It's not in your portfolio. Uh, and so what Chekhov's basic psychophysical exercises do is they help you engage your imagination and your body to be able to work together and restore or enlarge your portfolio. They enlarge your repertoire of potential expressions. So um, for me, uh, so, so that's just thinking more in terms of scientific ways to explain it might be useful. And, um, and, and the, uh, the other thing that I was thinking about is, uh, that process of um, whether or not you're interested in transforming or playing yourself over and over again. And that's, that's probably the, this most central question for, um, for a, for example, a really sort of died in the wool Meisner person who's been trained to stay out of their own personal impulses you know, jump to the tempo rhythm question. Um, do your characters tend to have the same tempo and rhythm? And do you find yourself playing the same character? Are you satisfied with the level of transformation that you're making? So those are questions that I think uh, the, this uh, sense of, um, of, uh, uh, you know, the, the distinction that Mr. Chekhov can offer us from this uh, quantum peak perspective. Time-wise, for me, in the classroom, the, uh, 
resistant, the, to me, setting up the quantum peak concept in your piece of the pie, it's not in your, in your piece of the pie, or some short, um, you know, it's not in your portfolio. Some, some short language saves so much time over the course of uh, working with somebody because every time they can't do something, I can very quickly say, it's okay, it's just not in your piece of the pie. And it makes them safe, instantly safe, because they know they can always expand the ingredients of their piece of the pie. When you do this, so that felt weird, didn't like it, didn't feel different. I didn't feel a change when I did this exercise. That's because it is in your piece of the pie, right? Uh, if I couldn't do it, it's because it's maybe outside of the piece of the pie. So for me, setting up that construct becomes a shortcut for later. And that's why I, I like to invest in that. And... Um, uh, Will, is there anything you wanted to add? Yeah, I want to throw into that mix the POAs because my students now, I have them doing the POAs. And I think as you're talking about for them to discover pieces of pie that are not theirs, for them to go out and observe, and I have them observe other people, they realize, oh, they are expanding and contracting in a way I've never thought of. Oh, they are, you know, pushing and pulling and doing things that I never even looked at before. So when they come back with the POAs, it makes them more excited to expand their piece of the pie and also makes them realize that, you know, what we sometimes see in life, you would think no one would believe that if I put that on the stage. And so then it makes that more real to them. And like Gail was saying about being authentic and real and young actors love to talk about that. And then they realize, oh, that person was walking on campus with their backpack like this, you know, and that was something that came up the other day. And most people in my class, they don't walk that way. They wouldn't even think someone would do it. They would think that's theatrical. But yet from observing it in life and then sharing it with everybody, I think it's expanding everybody's piece of the pie in a way and for them to want to expand. So I really think those POAs are important to get them out there in the world and seeing and observing. That's the, the home play, the practice, observe and apply. Hey, Will, I know you're going to have to go in a few minutes, and I was wondering if you would just reread, show us one more time, the booklet from Mala Powers um, that accompany the audio tapes that the five guiding principles are on, and would you reread for us, please, that section that you did? And Jeff's got it there, too. All right. Hey, good, Jeff. So I believe that the more gifted one is, the more one needs the technique to avoid accidents. If we are gifted, we may not find the character. We may not find the last thing which makes us so happy on the stage. And each day, each year, we will lose more and more our ability to be always spontaneous and creative. And again, I love what Jet was saying that she's been in this class for a while or you know, she's been involved in theatrical work for a while, but, you know, to do this work, how that's made, you know, Jed, it's made you more free from what you're saying and doing all the impulse work that we've done with Chekhov. And, you know, that's great to hear. So it's not as if you're going to get to a certain spot, which I think some actors consider, oh, I'm there. And then they don't keep exploring, you know, and this is just a great uh, idea to just keep that all going. Fantastic. Well, before we wrap up, I just want to make a couple of uh, announcements. Uh, one is we are um, making these lovely shirts available that Will and I are wearing. Will's shirt is how many years old? Like 10 years old, Will? Probably, yeah. Probably yeah. And, and mine is, <laughs> yeah, it's really held up and mine is uh, brand new. And um, they're going to be available to any of you. I'm going to just place an order once a year, a custom order. So you need to order it in advance. Um, but uh, we'll be sending out an email and posting that information. Um, and, and then it'll arrive. You know, I'll send it to you. I'll get the big box and then I'll personally send them to you. And um, the, the charts are also available and uh, you can arrange to purchase those through Charlie. And we do uh, have our upcoming um, 
CTI uh, in New Mexico, May 31st to June 6th, 2020. And then we expect we're going to be coming back to Dallas and starting the following week at uh, University of Texas Arlington for a deeper by demand, which may focus um, uh, on combat and physical, uh, may have a stronger focus on some, some combat and checkoff. So to spread the word for that, uh, it, that will be very exciting. We're also uh, looking to uh, keep this program going. Uh, so we expect to meet this time next week and address guiding principle number two. So we'll invite you uh, all for that. And we mentioned, uh, Gail, especially you mentioned the thinking, feeling, and willing. And there is a really excellent video uh, that Charlie and I did about the thinking, feeling, and willing as three psychological forces. And you may have heard in Mr. Chekhov's talk that psychology means not just the thinking, but it is the thinking, feeling, and willing forces of the soul forces. And uh, so when he says psychophysical, he's talking about your imagination, he's talking about your feeling forces, and he's talking about your will force combined with physical movement. That is truly what creates psychophysical and distinguishes it, as Mr. Chekhov said in the beginning, from simply random kind of uh, physical movement training. And that's what makes it special for the, the human being artist, which is who we are. So thank you so much, everyone. We'll see you next yeah. week. Bye. sort of stylistically how it changes the actor, that it opens up multiple possibilities. So I think that's what I was most fascinated by. It was really neat to sit back and watch and witness that. Great. How familiar are you with this technique? Well, actually, I did the intensive last winter and um, had a great time. I also took this in my first acting class at the University of Florida. So I've been able to use it. I've been directed by a Michael Chekhov um, teacher. So that was used in a show I was in, Miss Witherspoon, which was fabulous because we had a common dialogue that we could um, work on the character together. So I love that, having that communication, and it really helped me to give me a focal point in the rehearsal process as an actor. And then I actually taught acting for non-majors at the University of Florida, where I was able to instill a lot of these tools and translate them to um, acting for non-majors, which was a blast. We did a lot with psychological gesture, um, the three sister sensations. Those were things that we focused on. Focal points was a big one. So we had a blast. Yeah, it's been great. Hi, what do you take away from this evening? I think how transformational the tools can be and how they can transform the actor into the character and, and also how it opens up the interpretation for the actor. And how familiar um, are you with the checkoff technique? <laughs> I did the winter intensive January 2013 and I did the summer intensive in 2013 and I have been using the tools in my acting one class and also I directed a musical for young audiences. Miss Nelson is missing and I use the tools as part of my rehearsal process. And which tools do uh, your students appreciate the most? We use the archetypal gesture in my acting one class a lot to help physicalize objectives and intentions, and I think that that was enormously helpful. My favorite person is... on your imaginary bodies.